Discerning Hearts provides content dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. To continue production of these videos, prayers, and more, go to discerninghearts.com and click the donate link found there or inside the free Discerning Hearts app to make your donation. Thanks and God bless. Discerninghearts.com presents Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors. I'm your host, Chris McGregor, and I am delighted to be joined once again by Dr. Larry Chapp, a retired professor of theology who taught at DeSales University for over 20 years. He is now the owner and manager of the Dorothy Day Catholic Worker Farm near Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. With Dr. Larry Chapp, we go inside the pages of Confession of a Catholic Worker, Our Current Moment of Christian Witness, published by Ignatius Press. Dr. Chapp, thank you so much for joining me. It's great to be here again, Chris. I always enjoy talking with you, so thanks for having me. It was a joy when I got this book in my hands, The Confession of a Catholic Worker, Our Current Moment of Christian Witness. And for those who are looking at the video, you're going to see that I had so many tabs. I, I had to take some of them out, Larry, because I couldn't turn the pages. They were getting in my way. <laughs> I ended up having and I'm marking in the book something in pen, which I would never do. But then again, I'm not planning on giving this to anybody. This is such a great work. Thank you so much. That's uh, I, I really appreciate that. That's high praise coming from you, and I appreciate that. Thank you very much. When you hear the term orthodox, I remember a long time ago, a saintly old nun, elderly nun by the name of Angelica, had talked about <laughs> how there, and I say in all reverence, she would say, what's orthodox? She goes, well, you know, sometimes you're driving on the road and and some people are on the left and some people are on the right. And she goes, orthodoxy is right down that yellow line. And what I found really compelling about this book is that this is right down that yellow line. And how you are trying to help us to see how we're, some are drifting this way and drifting that way, it can be hard, can't it? It can be very hard. There are so many uh, false binaries in the church today, so much conflict and controversy, so many polarities. And the one thing that seems to me to be utterly lacking is a, a deep theology, an appreciation for deep theology. It's one of the reasons why I do these videos with big time theologians on my podcast, because their voices need to be heard and they're not being heard. And you're right, there is a theology out there that, in a sense, transcends these binaries and gives us a kind of well-rounded, full-orbed Catholic orthodoxy. That does, I mean, take, for example, the, the divide in the church today between those who are like pro-life and are all concerned about, you know, the LGBTQ stuff and life issues, and rightly so. And then there are those who are all into social justice, economic justice, criminal justice, or, you know, all those sorts of things. And those two camps in the church need to be brought together. And just in my opinion, uh, Dorothy Day and others like her have, have brought those things together. I love that you have that connection with Dorothy Day, but also, and this will be jumping into the middle of the book, essentially, it was Peter Morin. Am I pronouncing his name properly? I always pronounce it Peter Morin. I've heard people pronounce it Peter Morin. He was French, so maybe it is Morin. I don't really know. I'm just trying to sound continental, if that's okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm faking it. So, but I'll go, I'll, I'll see to you. I did, what is it? A friend of ours, Dr. Adrian Walker, who is a renowned translator, I asked him once, is it Athanasius or Athanasius? And he said, it is what it is wherever you are. And don't worry about it. But in this particular case, I really want people to get to know him, especially through your book, because I haven't read as much about him. And as I have, of course, Dorothy Day, and he seemed to really touch your heart. Oh, very much so, for a lot of reasons, one of which he was the co-founder of the movement, and he was Dorothy Day's intellectual mentor. He was extremely influential on her. And yet, of course, he, he died in, in the late 40s, uh, possibly of Alzheimer's. And so his name just sort of got eclipsed in the movement and forgotten. And especially as we moved into the 1960s and the anti-war and civil rights movements took hold and the activist wing of the Catholic worker movement kind of then dominated. And of course, Dorothy Day was more of an activist in that regard. And so she came and of course, she was still alive. But Peter Morin was not really into political activism so much as he was into culture building. 
and subculture building. And what he said often was, you know, we need to build the new society within the shell of the old. He wasn't a big fan of revolutions and overthrowing governments and going to jail. Not that those things are necessarily bad in and of themselves. Lots of great Catholic workers have gone to jail for the cause, and I don't mean to diminish that. But that was not Peter Morin. He was, his vision was more, as he called it, cult, cultivation, and culture. In other words, the religion, the religious vision of, of Christianity, cultivation, a sort of, but he was a localist before his time. It's not just back to the landism. It was regenerating a connection with the local. And then, of course, culture, cult, culture, cultivation. I guess I inverted those. And, you know, politics is downstream of culture. And in many ways, our acceptance of our religion, Christianity, is downstream of culture as well and generates all these controversies. Uh, and so I think Peter Morin's vision, he didn't write a whole lot. He wrote these things called easy essays and uh, very pithy sorts of things. He didn't write a whole lot of deep, profound intellectual works. And yet he left enough behind for us to know what he was about. He is someone who, when Dorothy Day encounters him, it speaks to everything that she was feeling in her heart. He allowed her to kind of give it form, as it were, wouldn't you say? Yes. She had just converted to Catholicism. She had been seeking, seeking, seeking something spiritual for a long time, and she had been attracted to Catholicism for a while. She finally converted, which created a great loss in her life where her common law husband, Forster, hated religion, and he and she had to part ways. He was the father of her child, Tamar, and she had to make a decision. You know, I'm a Catholic now when she converted, and I, I, I can't stay cohabitating with this man. Dorothy was a fully orthodox Catholic in, in a radical sort of way uh, and realized, well, I, I can't cohabitate, and so he left her. And that remained a pain in her life. I, he, she, he was the great love of her life. So in other words, she needed some kind of forming. And Peter Morin came on the scene, and he was the one who taught her and formed her intellectually and showed her, essentially, I think, that she wasn't crazy, that you could be a radical and not be an atheist. That was her constant refer- How does Her Marxist friends always asked her, how can you be a radical and not be an atheist? And that was the burning question in her early conversion. And he showed her how you can be a radical and a Catholic. And that was absolutely critical. That was the turning point in her formation. I think it's important, too, that we look at the context of their times, because sometimes when you hear commentators speak about Dorothy Day, they'll say, well, she was a Marxist or a communist. And This is important. Yeah. And the where our nation was at that time the context is essential. It is. And I just wrote an article for Catholic World Report called uh, Dorothy Day's Prophetic Anarchism. I explained you know, what it meant that she was an anarchist. It didn't mean she was against government as such. It meant she was against, again, according to her times, the great Leviathan of the Hobbesian Leviathan of the overreaching state. She was opposed to centralization and massive federal governments. She even opposed Social Security because she thought it was too great an increase in federal power and sought instead local initiatives to ameliorate the conditions of the poor. Nevertheless, she did remain sympathetic to Marxism her entire life, and this creates a lot of problems for people who can't understand how can you be an Orthodox Catholic, which she was, and yet remain sympathetic to Marxism. Well, I know a lot of Catholic theologians, thoroughly Orthodox. I don't know them personally, but you've got guys like Herbert McCabe and so forth who understand that it's possible to find great value in Karl Marx's critique of capitalism and yet reject his atheism, reject his dialectical materialism, reject his class warfare motif of things. And Dorothy did reject all of those things and yet continued to believe from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. She believed in a kind of economic egalitarian society where the great economic inequalities are erased. And we live in a nation, and she, especially in her time, lived in a nation before labor unions, before labor laws, before child labor laws, where the great robber baron capitalists, even though anti-monopoly legislation had been in place, the robber baron capitalists were still still in place. And she understood that there needed to be a, a, a critique of that from somewhere. And so she did remain kind of sympathetic to those sorts. I mean, people often bring up, and in the, in the com box of my recent article, it comes up, 
that she famously said in the early 1960s, God bless Fidel Castro. She was originally kind of smitten with the Castro revolution in Cuba because, you know, Cuba had become a giant brothel, a giant mafia controlled casino. It was just a playpen for the rich and the poor in Cuba were suffering. And so she had this soft spot in her heart for any sort of political movement that would throw down the mighty from their thrones, to quote the Magnificat. And and so she says, you know, God bless Fidel Castro. But, she, you know, this was before Castro showed his true colors, so to speak, as, as, as this truly repressive man. And later on, she, you know, she acknowledges everywhere that insofar as Marxist regimes engage in this kind of repression, they are to be rejected, root and branch. And yet, you know, Dorothy was a real human being and she had inconsistencies. And I think it's important to point that out. She wasn't always completely consistent with her own convictions because she had this burning zeal for the poor. And that sometimes caused her, I think, to be a bit naive about some of these political movements that were ostensibly, at least in theory, done in order to ameliorate the conditions of the poor. And, and so people throw that up against you know Dorothy Day all the time. But I think it's unfortunate because it doesn't read her charitably. And you, as you point out, it doesn't read her in the context of her times and what it was she was truly trying to achieve. She was a thoroughly orthodox Catholic. She did not embrace communism. She rejected Soviet-style Marxism and Mao, Mao Zedong's Marxism. She rejected all of that. And, and that's important to point out. Yeah, I don't think we appreciate, you know, for example, those who might bring up that particular soundbite found in her life in, a early, in the early stages, that they're the same folks that will embrace G.K. Chesterton, who was very adamant about his feelings about big business and big government. He didn't like either of them. And the balance of that is the challenge. I mean, and she wasn't just writing about it in a study in England. She was boots on the ground, dealing with the poor, dealing with the lines, and the changing cultural experience right there in the midst of it. Yeah, she was. And she was, I like what your phrase there, boots on the ground, because that's what she was about. So I think it's really important, since she lived a long life and she wrote a lot and she was an activist and so on, to, and as I try to do in the book, to get to, I don't quote her a lot because I don't quote a lot of people in the book. It's not that kind of a book where I'm quoting all tons of people left there. I quote a few, Balthazar Ratzinger, Little Dorothy Day here and there. But I tried to avoid huge block quotes and all that kind of stuff. So I've been criticized by some Catholic workers. You know, well, you say all this about Dorothy Day, but you don't quote her that much. Well, I don't quote anybody really that much. And the fact is, though, my point is that it's important in dealing, analyzing Dorothy Day's legacy. I'm glad you brought up Chesterton to place her within the proper stream of Catholic intellectual tradition of the 20th century and to see what was essential in her thought, most critical in her thought. And that was very similar to Chesterton, Belloc, all of these Catholic distributists economically, a kind of small is beautiful E.F. Schumacher vision of economics. And she was squarely within that tradition of personalism, localism, distributism. That was her essential critique of society and the need for the church to have a radical commitment to the poor and the downtrodden. This was the, you know, the Sermon on the Mount. That was the essence of her message, and that's what I love about her. We'll return to Inside the Pages in just a moment. This is Chris McGregor of Discerning Hearts, a nonprofit Catholic apostolate dedicated to evangelization and spiritual formation through the use of new media. Discerning Hearts creates engaging multimedia specializing in audio and video productions which are faithful to the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church and its rich, authentic spiritual tradition. Its mission responds to the Church's call to use the media for evangelization, catechesis, and spiritual renewal. We have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truth shared through Discerning Hearts totally free to users throughout the world. Besides our website, DiscerningHearts.com, Discerning Hearts has a newly updated free app where users can find all their favorite Discerning Hearts programming, including Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Deacon James Keating, Mike Aquilina, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, and so many more. There, too, you'll find numerous beautifully produced devotionals and novenas, including the Holy Rosary and Stations of the Cross, to help users create a sacred time for prayer wherever they may be. Discerning Hearts programming can be found on numerous streaming platforms such as 
Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and so many more. Discerning Hearts also has an ever-growing YouTube channel. Discerning Hearts online spiritual retreats and seminars have helped souls in North and South America, Europe, Africa, Australia, the Middle East, and the Philippines. For many people all around the world, Discerning Hearts is a daily source of inspiration, spiritual nourishment, and encouragement. We can only do this thanks to the generous financial support of our friends and benefactors. Please consider donating to our mission today. The world is looking for answers, for spiritual guidance and authentic discernment, for relationship and community. Your support is very much needed and appreciated. Please keep our mission in your prayers and tell a friend about Discerning Hearts. We now return to Inside the Pages. We're talking to Dr. Larry Chapp about his book, Confession of a Catholic Worker, Our Current Moment of Christian Witness. When I was reading the book, I went back because you, you do quote that, you cite it. It's, what is it, Matthew chapter 5 through 7? Yeah. And that, when you look at that, of course, it starts out with the Beatitudes, which we, we hear so often, but there's a lot more to that sermon. There's a whole way of interacting in relationship with those around you. And I, I think that's an important thing for us to sit. It's like if we were to get up at Mass and leave after the at half of the homily. And Dorothy Day didn't do that, neither did Peter Morin. They stayed and they listened to the whole thing, and then they incorporated that gospel message in their lives. Yeah, well, and this cuts to the chase, too, of something that Dorothy and Peter both had in common which was a firm belief in a sense uh, long before the Second Vatican Council called for it, and I deal with it in the book, the universal call to holiness. Even someone like Bishop Robert Barron has pointed out that there had been a tendency in the church during her time to divide you know, Catholics between the laity who were called to the commandments, the, the life of the commandments, and then the path of perfection, which was essentially, as Barron calls it, for the spiritual athletes in the church, the celibates, the monks, the nuns, the, the priests, and, and Dorothy and Peter understood that this is the age of the laity. In a democratic era in which we live, in which there's generalized education increasing for the laity across the board, there was a need for the laity now to rise up and to realize that they too, as all the saints have said, are called to the life of poverty, chastity, and obedience. The evangelical councils were all called to the way of perfection. So when she read the Sermon on the Mount, she read the whole thing, and she said, we need to stop treating this as if it's an, an ethic for the elites, an ethic for the celibates who can live in monasteries and so forth, and to realize that the Sermon on the Mount is directed at all Christians. Jesus didn't say in the Sermon on the Mount as he was looking at the thousands of people in front of him, now this is for the few that can take it. The rest of you just look at the Ten Commandments. No, he said, you've heard it of old, but now I say unto you this, and deepens the commandments. He makes it and sets harder for for us to be a Christian disciple than simply following the path of the commandments. And we see this too. John Paul II, this is the 30th anniversary of Veritate Splendor. You know, he begins Veritate Splendor with that reflection on Christ's interaction with the rich young ruler. All right. And the rich young ruler says, well, I've lived the commandments my whole life. What do, what do I need to be holy? You know, geez, I'm paraphrasing. And Jesus says, well, you know, you know, he says, I've lived the commandments. Now what do I do? And he says, okay, give everything away and, and follow me. And the guy couldn't do it. And Jesus didn't chase after him and say, no, 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 I just said, okay, that's okay, you're doing fine, just live the commandments, I, I, that, I was just calling you to a higher state of perfection. He didn't say any of that. He turned around and said, you know what, this is why it's hard for a rich person to go to heaven. <laughs> and, and he didn't qualify it at all. In other words, the crisis we face, and we can get to the issue of crisis now, the crisis we face in the church today is a crisis of holiness. It's a crisis where we tend to believe that holiness is not really what we're called to. Or if we are called to it, it's a very watered-down sense of what holiness is as a set of pieties. And Dorothy Day was resolutely opposed to reducing the faith to simple, for the lay people to a set of pieties. Yeah, I think that's real key because a lot of people may not realize, too, that Dorothy Day was an oblate of St. Benedict. That's right, as am I. There you go. And me, too. And the thing is, it's about prayer and work in its action. It's living out, receiving the word, and then taking it out into the world. 
And the important thing to remember is that prayer that fueled her, that communion that she received in the relationship with God and the relationship that she would have with others. I couldn't help but think in the book, when I was reading it, I was reminded of the prophet Elijah and that scene where he's up with the prophet Sabal. And there had to be a decision made by Israel. You can't be this and that. It's either one or the other. What are you going to choose? And that's essentially what that response of Dorothy Day, fueled by that prayer, that communion, that relationship, that's what we're called to, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Dorothy Day was a daily mass goer. She engaged in Eucharistic adoration. She was a, a deeply prayerful woman who grounded everything that she did in terms of her political activism and his work, her work for the poor in the Sermon on the Mount, in her faith, in her prayer life, in her contemplation. And this is terribly, terribly important, lest the Catholic worker movement simply be reduced to a, a set of political actions devoid of that sort of deep spiritual orientation. This is critical, too. You mentioned the prophets of Baal, and, and this is pertinent to Dorothy and Peter, who believed that the modernity in the modern world was essentially under the grips of, you know, a, a different form of Baal worship, Moloch worship, the great principalities and powers. You know, as Chesterton once said, when you stop believing in God, it's not that you now believe in nothing, it's that you will now believe in anything. And, and so when you deny the ultimacy of God, you replace God, as, as I point out in the book, with those things which are penultimate. And you turn those things into your gods because we are innately religious beings. And whatever we're going to dwell upon becomes, in a sense, our religious orientation. And so Dorothy believed that it was critical for the modern church to be a, a prophetic church that engaged in the exposing of these idolatries. The essence of sin is idolatry. And the modern world is now under the throes and under the slavery of a set of illusions, a set of counterfeits, simulacrums of Christ, and idolatries. And the church, instead of exposing these idolatries, had tended to reach a modus vivendi with them, a kind of accommodation to them. And she saw this as precisely the major crisis of our time, that the church was not proposing to people a provocation, as Balthazar calls it, as I point out in the book, an Ernstfall moment. Ernstfall is a German word that means a decision that must be made in a moment of crisis for the faith in which not to choose is to choose, that there can be no fence sitting. The idolatries of modernity presents us with is another choice as Elijah presented to the people of Israel. You must now choose Christ or you're choosing by default to follow these idolatries. Hence why we're hemorrhaging people out of the church today because they have chosen to pursue the idolatries. And that can be a danger, too, because it can be, in choosing Christ, is choosing that Sermon on the Mount, is choosing Matthew 25. It's doing what he said to do, with those two great commandments, to love God and to love your neighbor. The problem can be, maybe for some, that their response becomes more of, I, I don't want to say a devotional aspect, that it's something that I have to take care of me and mine. And you're looking at the others without that lens of Christ, that lens of love. And it's exemplified even in the heart of the church because you can hear it really clear if you have those ears, which we all should, because it lacks virtue, right? It does lack virtue. And that ability to have patience and to listen and to be in relationship, to communicate with one another. And you bring that out in the book. Yeah, I mean, what, what we lack today is profundity and, and a profound theology that, that challenges people, especially young people. You know, youth is a time of idealism. Young people are seeking to orient their lives around big causes, things that are larger than themselves, something to believe in. I think it's part of the reason why you see in the church the rise in the popularity of a certain very superficial traditionalism among so many young people. And it's because they're, they're seeking out something that's at least got some teeth to it, some substance to it, and isn't just the pablum that they get in, in a lot of their parishes, where what I call them lettuce homilies. Let us go forth now and blah, 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 do this and do that. It's, you know, the homilies are boiled down to essentially, it's nice to be nice to the nice. And you, you learn a set of moral dictums that you probably already learned from your first grade teacher about proper etiquette in the lunch line. 
it doesn't require one to be a Catholic in order to pursue those values. And so a lot of people, young people especially, are looking at the church and saying, well, there's nothing here. There's absolutely nothing here that I can't get elsewhere. So what am I doing here on a Sunday morning? Uh, my friend Christopher Altieri just came out with an article in Crux Magazine last week in which he pointed out, you know, that all this talk at World Youth Day and leading up to the city and so forth from the Pope and others, and it's okay, you know, the church is a big tent. Everyone is included. Everyone is welcome. And that is all true. Okay, everyone is welcome. But as Chris points out, and this goes to my point, the deeper question that isn't being asked, which is what young people are asking, right, isn't am I included? It's why should I bother? Why should I want to be included? Fine, you've included me. Included me in what exactly? Okay, I mean, my wife spins wool and she has a spinning guild. All right, I'm not the slightest bit interested in that. And yet I'm welcome to join the spinning guild. I'm welcome to go there on Sunday afternoons when my wife spins wool with her friends. But I have no desire to. I don't want to bother with that. I'm not interested in it. And that's why a lot of people, especially young people, are looking at the church today. So what we need to do is to answer that question for people, why bother? And that means a church that has some substance to it. And the church does have substance to it, and that's the tragedy. That substance, as Peter, to go back to Peter Moore, Peter Moore says we need to blow up the dynamite of the church. And the dynamite he was talking about was precisely this deep, deep substance of the sanctity of the saints, the Catholic intellectual tradition, the, the, the universal cult to holiness, the substance of the faith is what's not being proposed. You offer for folks a really solid introduction to resourcement theology. And I know that sounds very fancy. I, I enjoy saying the word just because it's Again, one of those cases where your friends think you're smarter than you are. But essentially, it's going back and looking at what sustained the early church, what it was they understood the message of Christ to be, and how they lived it out at a time which was so much worse than our own in so many ways. I don't know if we'd survive if we had to go back and live the lives of those early Christians or the, uh, around the world. And yet, what was it that they knew? And that's what we need to really tap into. Yeah, ressourcement theology is a French word, simply means a return to the sources. And there was a movement in the 20th century, kind of began in the late 19th century, to move Catholic theology a little bit beyond the standard, you know, Thomistic synthesis of theology that was dominant at that time. And there's nothing, I love Aquinas, Balthazar quotes him more than any other author, De Lubac, others, yeah. But it was Aquinas, Aquinas, Aquinas all the way down, and there was nothing else, and it had become a bit more abundant, stale, stagnant, and a bit oppressive intellectually in, in the Catholic seminaries and so on. Balthazar referred to his training in, as a Jesuit scholastic as languishing in the desert of neo-scholasticism, which was his way of saying that, that kind of stale Baroque era Thomism. And so the resource mount thinkers came forward and said, yeah, Aquinas is great, but let's situate Aquinas within the broader tradition. He's not the only person in the broader tradition. If you read the Summa, it's a summa, it's a summation of what? Of the broader tradition. I mean, Aquinas would be, in a sense, the first person to come forward and say yes to resource monk. Okay. And it's it's a return to the scriptures, a more evangelical and scriptural foundation for theology. It's a return to the early church fathers and the early church, as you said, and to recover the deep, deep riches of of thinkers who were expositing Christianity and developing Christianity at a time when it was still fresh, it was still new, and, and people were still trying to figure it out, and they were in the face of great odds in the Roman Empire, uh, and even though in many ways their situation was worse than ours, in some ways our situation is worse than theirs, because at least the church fathers could deal with a population of people that were still oriented towards a, a religiosity even if it was pagan religiosity, they could count on a certain faith, in, at least in the realm of the, of the gods. Whereas we now face what I call in the book, the nullification of our religious sense in, in some very troubling ways. But Ressourcement formed the foundation then for the Second Vatican Council and the entire theologies of Ratzinger and Pope John Paul and so on. We'll continue the rest of our conversation in our next episode. With Dr. Larry Chapp, we've gone inside the pages of Confession of a Catholic Worker, Our Current Moment of Christian Witness. To learn more about this book or to obtain a copy, go to ignatius.com, the website for its publisher, Ignatius Press. 
or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com, or you can find it within the free Discerning Hearts app or wherever you download your favorite podcasts. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission, which is to offer authentic and rock-solid spiritual formation freely to souls around the world. And if you find us worthy, please consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible, to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com and join us next time for Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors.